Okay, so we're back. Another audiobook. What have you been reading? I am at this weird, awkward angle because the sun refuses to cooperate with me in filming. <laughs> Hi, table. So, what is it that I have just completed? And actually, I really liked this book. I will attempt, keyword attempt, to convey exactly why I liked it so much. The book is called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And the author is the one that did all the experiencing. Um, he, this entire book is told from the author's perspective um, through his young adult life all the way revolving around Vietnam. His experiences and stories with other individuals continuing on until he leaves um, uniformed service and his emotional uh, coming to terms and hunting for knowledge, understanding, and really why they were there um, to begin with for his own closure. And I feel like this book is very artsy. Out of all of the kind of very manly man stereotypical history themed account books of uh, any kind of conflict, specifically war. I'm sure there are other artsy books out there, but this one was very, like, I loved the way it was right. It starts out immediately with kind of like a laundry list of literally the things that they did carry while they were over there in Vietnam. Um, and as the list goes on, he begins to describe certain pieces and a link emotional bonds and or knowledge, fun facts, to those pieces. He went from, you know, uh, Lucky Charms, uh, pictures from family, from, you know, loved ones, from lovers. Um, how one Na Native American man, he carried um, a pair of moccasins, as well as a uh, hatchet, I do believe. Very specific, given by his grandmother, I do believe. And the various weapons that they would uh, carry the types of ammo, the types of food, um, what they would do with it, how they were always on the move, so they essentially would begin to, like, for funsies, destroy some of it in very manly man stereotypical for funsies because um, we have nothing to lose kind of attitude. And throughout this book, he very much, he'll usually kind of describe something, um, a story or a scenario, and he, he does it very much from his perspective, so there is a dis degree of distortion. And then even then, he goes in, he knows that it's distorted. He addresses that at this point, um, at a point in the book. And he does it very artfully. And he tries, and he tries, and I think very well succeeds, to incorporate emotion about how he felt, or how he felt in that specific moment, and allows you, the reader or the listener, to partake in that emotion and feel the dilemma that he probably felt. Um, some kind of connection. It wasn't just an account of stories. It was the push and the pull and the moral injury that all of those stories and experience caused. Not only him, but to others and potentially unresolved conclusions that those memories still to this day don't have. The author gives you the experience of getting his draft papers, um, goes into great detail how he, you know, plots and plans, um, you know, I'm a smart person, I'm going to college, I've been accepted to this great, wonderful college, uh, they don't want me in a war, I'm against this war, I've done activism against why we're there, um, and I'm being drafted. Um, and he runs away, and he stumbles upon this this old man in the middle of nowhere, it almost sounds like, and he's just like, I need a place to stay. Um, I'll pay. And he stays there for what sounds like a week, I do believe he stays there. And this man also does fishing. And at one point, the man never asks why he's run away. Doesn't ask why he's in great turmoil. He can clearly kind of see that this person, you know needs somebody, needs a place, um, is having a lot of issue, great moral issue, and he, at one point, 
They both go on the boat, and they go fishing, and he passes into, I do believe, Canadian waters, and the thought runs through our author that I could do it. I could just jump over the boat. I could swim into Canada, you know, um, and I, would ha I wouldn't I would have to go to war. Um, so he describes this very deep, impactful, because it will change the rest of his life, um, experience on this boat and how he breaks down um, and he cries and he in his head remembers and imagines like you know his childhood sweetheart his family everyone cheering him on to just go to jump you know to leave so that he doesn't have to go to war and and the the really big line that he ends with with that scenario is I was a coward I went to the war. And I was just like, dang, man. I felt like that was powerful. Um, I, I, I really liked it. I appreciated that. Um, it, was, it was amazing in the way he describes it, his experience. Um, but yes, he does go to Vietnam. And his big reason for that is he did not want to be ostracized by his loved ones, his family, and his community. I think less by his government, but he didn't want to let down and have people shun him. And that's the only reason why he went. He was essentially peer pressured into doing something that he thought was probably morally wrong to begin with. That can mess up a person. It's called moral injury. It's an actual thing. Um, look it up if you're interested. So this is another quote. You can tell a true war story if it embarrasses you. If you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. If you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. In any war story, but especially a true one, it's difficult to separate what happened from what seems to have happened. What seems to have happened becomes its own happening and has to be told that way. I mean, this is at the point where he's telling stories um, specifically revolving around death, all kinds, um, where he knows very clearly that there's distortion happening. It's almost too real or too close to home to be believed. Um, it's too strange, it's too immoral to be believed, or too weird and out there to be believed. The angles of vision are skewed. When a booby trap explodes, you close your eyes and duck and float outside yourself. When a guy dies, like Kurt Lemon, you look away, then back for a moment, and then look away again. The pictures get jumbled. You tend to miss a lot. Often the crazy stuff is true, and the normal stuff isn't, because the normal stuff is necessary to make you believe the truly, incredibly craziness. And again, the topic of the killing for the sake of killing came around and pops up throughout. He doesn't blatantly say that, but that's a reoccurring theme in a lot of reaccounts, accounts of uh, people's experiences in conflict zones. Things get caught in a crossfire, people get caught in a crossfire, and or... Um, he does say war is hell, um, and addresses the kind of weirdness around that term but also the trueness around it. They, like, had a... There's a story where, in this book, where they had a puppy for a while, and they were feeding it, and one of the guys who was a little bit looser in the nuts and bolts in his head decided it was a good idea to strap that puppy to a explosion device and throw it because he thought it was funny. I do believe that same character also lost a dear friend one day, and came across a baby water buffalo and literally tortured it to death by shooting it. And a knife. Yeah, that's fucked up. And I think that chapter kind of ended with, um, you're never more alive when you're almost dead. You recognize what's valuable. Order spills over into chaos. Um, and it's a lot of people don't know how to vent um, and when you're in a stress, stressor environment that doesn't seem like it has a lot of mor morality in it, you vent in really backwards ways, potentially, depending on the person, which 
brings me on to another story, and I'm going to call it Marianne because that's the character. There was a story where one of the men over there found a way, apparently, to bring over his wife to be with him in a place where they weren't, where it was a little bit safer considered. It was considered to be a little bit safer, so yes. And somehow he figured it out, so the story goes, to bring his wife over. And her name is Marianne. Now this is a kind of like a base, a camp set up, and it has an SF crew, a special forces group, attached to it. And they're kind of separated. And over time, Marianne arrives. Um, she's very wide-eyed, you know, like, I want to learn. She's very much like a sponge. She begins to learn how to aid, um, be a nurse. She begins to learn about the culture, the people um, of Vietnam, and she's, she wants to learn all that she can, how she can help and not just be a wallflower while she's in the encampment. Um, she eventually begins to do surgery um, learns how to do medical surgery and first aid, and w begins to kind of disappear at night. Um, and, you know, the, the potential husband or the boyfriend is becoming worried. He's just like, she's, she's acting a little bit more different now. She's, you know, she's very much absorbed with everything, um, and constantly learning and constantly learning. Come to find out, she walks into camp after they go looking in the entire encampment. She walks in, and she's been with the Special Forces group outside the wire, learning from them. The boyfriend is shocked and says, you shouldn't be doing that anymore. You don't have to take on that burden. You know, and she's just kind of like, okay, fine. Um, and everything seems fine and dandy for about a week or so. And then she goes back to doing it again. And this time, she doesn't come out of the SF camp. Um, and the... She's made the full transition. So the boyfriend goes in. It, it was almost like culturally taboo to go over there. Because they were very separate from the camp. Um, he goes in and he stumbles across her. And apparently she's singing, almost, um, I don't know if she's doing a cadence, it's not very clear, um, but it sound, it made it sound very eerie, because he sees her, and she has a necklace of, I do believe it's tongues, or ears, I think it's tongues, around her neck, and she's, to my mind, almost seemed like she was doing kind of, um, an esoteric ceremony, or a cultural ceremony. And all the SF guys are in another chunk of, on the opposite side, all in their, like, hammocks and their bunks and, you know, smoking, and they're very separate from her, but she's almost like a part of their group now. She's made the full transformation. She goes out with them regularly. And that's kind of how the story ends. She, it's said that she one night just went out with them and then disappeared into the night and became one with Vietnam and the forests and the mountains and that she's still out there living off the land and killing at random. Um, and you don't know if that's a real story or not. There, you could see possibly, you know, he's always hinting there's a kernel of truth in every single story, um, but you don't know what's real and what's not. And at this point in the book, he really begins to shift the focus lens onto his comrades or who he was around most often, <clears throat> giving you stories about them. I don't know if he's doing it in a specific order or to give you kind of a little bit of a jarring effect because it did feel a little jarring to do these out of order. He gives you the new medic's story before he gives you the first medic story. Um, so I'll tell it in that order. Their new one basically is, in his first firefight, he freezes up, he does you know, he, do, he doesn't want to move, um, and our, our, and the author gets hit in the butt, gets shot in the butt, and he's going into shock, he can't, he's, he's yelling for the medic, the medic eventually moves, but it feels like an eternity, 
he aids him, um, but the whole time he's trying to say shock, treat for shock, and he can't say it, and the guy's just like, knock it off, knock it off. So he botches the job. Um, he, the author, as a result, is sent back to, and separated from his group and that camaraderie, and is in a way an outsider now from the group, squad, whatever you want to call it, and now wants revenge on this medic. The medic begins to actually get with the program, and he becomes a really good medic, and is accepted into the group um, immediately almost, sounds like, after that incident because he does such a good job. The group comes back to base, and the author wants his revenge, no matter what. Even though the medic came up to him and said, you know what, I, I screwed up, I'm sorry, I would like to make peace, Hand, handshake of friendship, and he just walks away. He's just like, I want to forgive you, but at the same time, you need to feel what I felt. It, you know, go through what I've gone through. So, while the medic is taking his turn guarding a certain chunk of the base, he, the author recruits another member of the group, who honestly sounds like he's a little off of his rocker, um, to scare the ever-living crap out of the medic. Um, and in the beginning, it sounds like the medic is, is scared shitless. Um, there's a lot of uh, lore and creepiness in the dark that has been built up over the uh, course of the war and the environment and the thinking about the night and how the um, their enemy the just comes and goes fluently with the night. Um, they're just su such skilled warriors that they strike fear into the hearts of the U.S. soldiers, essentially. And at the end of the of the scare tactic, he's basically like, knock it off, man. Like, no, I'm, I'm tired of, he, he's been scared enough. But the guy he's recruited to help scare this medic keeps going. And eventually, the medic just pops up and goes, I know who you are, and I know you're trying to scare me. Knock it off. Um, and the author is himself almost, like, scared back into his state and I think at what he's done or what he's tried to do toward, towards the medic and the guy he's recruited to help him pretty much like kicks him in the head and talks shit to him and and is just like wow you're a piece of work you wanted to scare this guy so badly and walks off. Later on the medic and the author shake hands and say that they're, that we're even and everything. His story was weird um, but a lot of these are there's, there's like no right and wrong. There's, I mean, there are very, some, some of these stories are very wrong. But when it comes to the human, <clears throat> the human interaction, sometimes they're very weird. There was another one where, um, kind of like the acceptance to the group, if you were new, they would go through a village and after just having bombed the crap out of it, and there was, like, this dead gentleman. So they would shake the hand of this dead individual. They'd sit next to it, have meals, offer it food, um, have it, like, normal conversations with this person, kind of ending with a, aw, shucks, kind of, well, you're dead. Um, weird. Probably a sense of trying to familiarize yourself with death, seeing it that it is a fact, also not being afraid of it. Also a sense of de desensitization. This is normal. Coming to terms with seeing horrifying things. Um, and that kind of group mentality of, well, you should go and pay your- like, show your respect. Go say hi to the man. I think was- what they peer pressured everybody to do, and the author was just like, no, no, that's, that's not something I'm gonna do. And one of the guys later goes, I'm glad you didn't do that. It is kind of disrespectful. You know, <laughs> weird stories like that throughout this entire book. And for me, I don't see um, a clear defined Oh my god, that's a horrible story. Ah. Um, I, I see it more as 
that's strange. That seems unnatural. Why and where is the person that thinks that that's okay to do? Like, where is that person right now? Um, what are they going through and why? I'm always asking why. And then it's just like, clearly something is wrong here. Clearly help is needed. Clearly something needs to be undone um, and or, you know, changed, uh, fixed. Work needs to be done because this is in weird, uncanny, weird territory that doesn't seem right. But later the author goes on to comment and literally create a story. His first kill when he kills someone. Um, and the, the way he tells the story is it has a flow but at the same time it's disjointed. So he says how it kind of happened and he immediately um, he describes looking at the male that he has just killed and immediately his thoughts wander to this person had a family. Maybe he was about to graduate. Maybe he was about to go to the next job. How many kids did he have at home? And they're not so much, they start kind of as questions and then they turn into a whole narrative story. He creates this massive story behind this individual that he's just taken in his life. Um, and how, how he was rising in the ranks of his military profession and um, got, had a child on the way or was moving from one village to the next, how he looked forward to harvesting, you know, crops with his dad or something. You know, he created this massive um, inner thought process and narrative and story behind this person that he didn't even know. Um, arguably, he probably didn't even know the language. But in, in some way, kind of humanizing the person that he has just taken life from and trying to think of all the things that this person potentially could and or would have done um, is very interesting. It, it really transports the reader into a degree of the shock that the author is trying to convey. And I think he does a really good job of that. And he goes on to basically say that, you know, we describe narratives and full stories for each person that, you know, that we, that we, the people that we, our brothers that we killed and, you know, like our first deaths, um, or the first people that we killed. Uh, storytelling as therapy wanting to talk about the experience but not fully being seen by others, um, want, to, the want to be heard but not want to be, and yet at the same time not wanting to be heard because you're supposed to be the manly man. Finding life, learning, and motivation upon returning home um, to the U.S. Uh, the challenge with seeing ghosts and or people, he's, people they've killed and or the brothers that they have lost and the, their thoughts about suicide, all told through another person's story slash perspective. He tells all of, all of the entire book is told in a very story-like manner. From, usually it's from his perspective, but as well as creating a story or a narrative around another person, even though he's not that person. And, but that's his, like, perspective. Um, and at the end of the book, he, he still struggles with the things that he's done, the war itself, why it had to be, and he goes back to Vietnam and he faces a lot of the places again. He goes and seeks out the places where they lost people or a particular experience had a really big impact on him, and he has a moment with those places. And he wonders how much of the, you know, the anger is still there. Even though this place looks like such a beautiful valley or, you know, a beautiful uh, farmland, you know, something really dreadful has happened there. And he contemplates uh, how much the local population still remembers and everything that he carries and remembers. Um, and how best to articulate all of his memories 
um, and reach a conclusion through writing. And he takes his, his daughter, it sounds like his daughter, with him on that journey. Um, and he tries to convey and tell her stories and experiences, but she's very young, so oftentimes there's a really obvious separation and divide between what he sees in a place and what she sees in a place. Oftentimes the story will be interrupted by um, somebody outside that he's telling the story to, and they'll be like, what a weird, weird location, or they're like, Oh, it stinks here. Let's move on. Meanwhile, he's having this huge, massive, you know, deep, contemplative thoughts about the location and coming to terms with that location and realizations about the population in that area. Um, he sits down and listens to, you know, the Vietnamese, their side of the story, their experiences, their very um, hor horrifying experiences, and how some of them still survived. He goes and addresses some Vietnamese that helped them over time. Um, it sounds like oftentimes the U.S. soldiers didn't know the place, obviously, as well as a local who probably, you know, that's their backyard. Um, they would team up with a local to navigate the rice paddies and or the places that had uh, were known to be booby-trapped booby to navigate through. Um, and then they would just, like, nope out and leave the guy behind. They'd give him a bunch of food and be like, thanks, bye. <laughs> ah, that, I feel personally, like, this was a very good book. Uh, especially if you don't like the way normal, average, stereotypical military books of accounts of, um, wars are written. This one's really, it's pretty, it's interesting. Um... I'm going to be honest, I don't know much about Vietnam, and I feel like I should educate myself. Yeah, I will do more of that. Um, I highly recommend this book if you're into that kind of storytelling. So I hope that you all have a wonderful day, morning, evening, noon, somewhere in between, and that you pick up an audiobook or a book or a book that you've been meaning to read that's been sitting on your shelf for decades and that you, uh, you know, endow yourself with some knowledge. Alrighty. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye for now.